it's ready along with the full recipe. So I picked this recipe because it is so great for helping dry up excess mucus in the body. And Ayurveda looks to the seasons and eating seasonal ingredients to provide the medicine that we need. And in Ayurveda, the system of medicine from India, it does not concern itself with calorie counting and uh, the ratio of proteins to fats to carbs. The lens that Ayurveda looks at are certain qualities of food and how they make you feel after you've digested them. Whether they make you feel light or heavy, dull or sharp, hot or cool, slimy or dry. These are the kinds of characteristics that Ayurveda views life through. And with regard to the diet, it'll look to six different tastes on the palate. And different tastes have different functions in the body. And during this time of year in the spring, when the earth is thawing out from the frost and the riverbeds are swollen and the sap is running in the trees, we've got this quality of heaviness of wetness in the natural world. And being a holistic system, Ayurveda says, well, the same laws that govern in nature are the same laws that govern in our own physiology. So this is a time of year in this area anyway, that we have in the Northern hemisphere more dampness broadly. Now that'll vary depending on what part of the states you live in. And know that that is why there tends to be a feeling of heaviness in the spring as we're transitioning out of winter time into this wet summer. Oh, I'll mute you there, Ada. So I'm just talking about the general qualities of food and the taste. And this time of year, we have this heaviness, this dampness, in the springtime. And so we want to counteract that with ingredients that are going to be astringent in their properties that'll help suck out moisture, excess moisture in the tissues. And bitter taste, astringent taste do a really good job of that. So that's why in the springtime naturally is the inclination to have more salads and greens versus the wintertime here in the North where it wouldn't be necessarily uh, appropriate unless those greens were cooked and prepared in a different manner. So that's why I picked this recipe. It dries out, same with millet, which is the grain we're working with today, which has that drying sucking quality to it. So for those who have or suffer allergies, often that's a result of a heavy digestion, that the digestive capacity is not balanced enough, not strong enough to actually metabolize the food and eliminate it. And so this cumulative buildup of metabolic waste, we call it ama in yoga and Ayurveda. And this ama is the mama of disease, we say, that this accumulation creates this fogginess, this mental fog that we experience, the swings in mood and the chronic fatigue, as well as just bogging down the communication between the cells themselves. And so as this accumulates, this creates a certain process and pathogenesis that creates chronic inflammation. And this silent systemic inflammation is really causing us a lot of woes. And so by eating seasonally and balancing with these ingredients with opposing properties and qualities, we can very naturally get the medicine that we need. Now for the ingredients I mentioned, millet being very dry, millet is a grain that has a lot of protein. It actually comes, it's from the family of buckwheat. And I'm gonna bring this really close to the camera. You see there are tiny little pearls here. And we're gonna start our meal today by preparing the millet mash. Now millet goes rancid very quickly. So it's best to buy it in small quantities when you can. 
and you store it in a closed container in the fridge and that'll keep it from going bad quickly. So go ahead and measure out a half a cup of your millet. We're gonna rinse that in a fine sieve or if you don't have a fine sieve, I just have a colander that I cut a piece of um, cheesecloth in. The beads are really tiny. So we can go ahead and put that in and just rinse it in some cool water for a few minutes and then let it drain in the sink as we come back and prep your cauliflower. Just rinsing off any dirt or debris. And then we're essentially going to start by cooking the millet with our chopped cauliflower with some water and salt. And this is a nice light and drying base for your dish. You could serve this with virtually any vegetable dish, even a lean protein like chicken or fish. The, uh, it's, it was always on the line at uh, Propalu in the cafeteria as an alternative to mashed potatoes. So, you know, a nice different version that was a bit lighter, which makes it so good for the heaviness of, of spring. So we're only gonna need a cup and a half of chopped broccoli or cauliflower florets. Go ahead and peel away the stems and let me know, let's see if I can move this a little closer. So you guys can do better. And if you guys have questions, go ahead and just unmute yourself and or type it in the chat if your hands are free and clean to do so. I'm gonna cut off a big honk here. You don't need to be too fancy with it because we're just gonna cook it down with the millet and eventually mash it. So don't be too concerned with chopping it too small or pretty. We have no takers for video tonight. Yeah, sorry about that, Chris. I don't know. It won't let me turn on the video on my cell phone for some reason. No worries. Maybe next time you can join with an iPad or laptop. Yeah. All right. Side. So go ahead and take your one and a half cups of your cauliflower, put it in a medium saucepan with your rinsed half a cup of millet. Add two and a half cups of water. Funny, millet always makes me think of mustard seeds because they're so small and round like mustard seeds. Now, because they're a lot higher in protein than other grains, it takes longer to digest millet. So that's why we want to use some spices, which will add to this to help the digestion along. So once you've got that together, go ahead and add a teaspoon of salt. Turn it on high to bring it to a boil. Sorry, Chris, add a teaspoon of what? Salt. Salt, okay. Two and a half cups of water. And we'll get that going on high. Okay. 
And while that gets going, turn on the right burner here. You're going to wash your zucchini. You can leave them peeled, I do, and I just trim off the ends. We're going to slice them on the diagonal in rounds, about maybe half an inch thick or a quarter inch thick, depends on what your preference is. We're just going to saute these, pan roast them. So nothing too fancy, but it'll take a good half hour for the millet and cauliflower to be ready. So in the meantime, we're gonna do our veggie prep here. So I'm just gonna trim off the ends. Now balancing out all the drying properties of the millet and the greens, we've got really water and in watery ingredients here. Zucchini, tomato have a lot of water content in them. And that's really good for- And you, how much water? Two and a half cups. Okay. And in the, if I can find my cup. <laughs> yeah, and this is being recorded too. So anything you miss, you know, you'll get the replay tomorrow along with all the recipes. But I was saying that the watery ingredients of the zucchini and the tomato, really help with people who are experiencing stiffness in their joints or a lot of heat in the joint. So if you've got some more local inflammation, then introducing ingredients with the coolness of the water element is gonna just naturally help keep that area from becoming too flared up. I don't know if you knew this, but zucchini, even though the name is Italian, it actually originates from Mexico. It is a unripe or a young fruit on this vine in Mexico, which I thought was really interesting. I always thought of zucchini as strictly Italian, but nope, it come from Mexico along with a lot of other squashes, which were a staple for Mexican indigenous peoples, along with maize and beans and peppers. I'm learning out here, there's a big influence of Chicana culture and green chili peppers is on nearly every menu I go to. So later in this series, actually, we're gonna make a mole sauce with some green chili. So got that honored into the schedule. All right, you're basically gonna coat your zucchini with olive oil, toss it with some salt, some pepper, very simple. A lot of times when we have excessive dryness in the body and in the joints, it'll manifest as popping and clicking stiffness. And that's when having ingredients with high water content can be especially therapeutic for you. Those who naturally have a tendency to retain water or digest more slowly or perhaps just have a really sluggish or weak digestion. The balance of having the bitter greens and the astringency of the millet balance out the wateriness of the zucchini and the tomatoes. Now it's not one for one, of course, we're just talking about the qualities. So because Ayurveda is this art of daily living, it's in your actual practice of it and tweaking recipes and ingredients in terms of its proportions and your observation of what symptomology are you experiencing in your body and what do you experience after you've consumed and digested these ingredients. So 
of salt and pepper. Now, before we joined, I had actually washed my zucchini, so don't flip out. Zucchini's clean. And freshly ground black pepper, which is a great resina for the lungs. Again, a site of excess mucus and heaviness, especially during allergy season. So even just rubbing up some of your more pungent spices like peppers and chilies and garlic are favorable this time of year or for that excess heavy or wet quality. The garlic in the garden is almost ready. Oh yeah, Trina's got this kick ass garden with enough garlic to feed or <laughs> feed an army but it's amazing i can't wait to have some when it comes up okay oh, yeah. wait hopefully soon and garlic scapes too so and garlic scapes now now one goes in the zucchini i mean yeah uh, we just toss the zucchini with some olive oil salt and pepper and putting it aside for now. We're not actually you're cooling that not the zucchini, I mean the the other thing with the millet. You want some salt in it? Yeah, just a little bit of salt, teaspoon of salt with the cauliflower and the millet and the water. And water, and that's it, right? Yeah. We're going to boil before we cover it, lower it, simmer it for half an hour. So while that's coming to a boil, we're just prepping some of the other veggies. Okay. And wash your cherry tomatoes. We're going to use a cup of cherry tomatoes. Actually, a cup and a half. Is it a cup and a half? No, I think it's a cup I wrote. Is it a cup? One cup okay. of cherry yeah. tomatoes halved. I'm going to go ahead and slice those while everything else continues to prepare. Oh, oh man. So tomato and tomato skins specifically have this wonderful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory called lycopene in the skin. It's known for, especially for some cancer preventing mechanism actually helps prevent the growth of cancer cells, more specifically prostate cancer. Uh, so leaving the skins on the tomatoes is especially helpful to get that micronutrient. And I'm not a nutrition, so don't ask me specifically what vitamins are in these and minerals. I might know some. But again, it's not really the lens that Ayurveda looks to. And Ayurveda is going to want to concern itself with whether you're eating or favoring the astringent, bitter, and pungent flavors. Those are the flavors you want to favor during the spring season. Or anytime you're experiencing a bit of heaviness, or water retention, swelling. Okay, I think that's probably a cup. Let's see. Almost. More. I cannot wait for the farmers markets here to get going. I'm not really in full swing here yet. There's lots of talk, but not a lot of produce happening and the squares that I've seen so far. I don't know about where you guys are. Have there been farmer's markets yet in Massachusetts, my Easties, or in New York? Mine starts up June 19th, so okay. they say. Yeah. All 
great option. I'm going to put the tomatoes aside as well. My water is almost about to boil. How's everyone doing in their kitchen so far? We all together? Yep, mine's already to a boil. Awesome. Go ahead and lower the heat, put a lid on it, and set your timer for 30 minutes. Hey, Sharon. Sharon Sita, so glad you're here. Awesome. All right, now mine's coming to a boil. Go ahead and lower that to low. And throw a cover on it. Now, what are you doing with that? What's that? Now the cauliflower has come to a boil, so I am lowering the temperature, mm -hmm. covering it, and we're going to simmer it for half an hour. Oh, now you're going to simmer it? Yep. Okay. It's basically like an alternative to mashed potatoes, but we're not using potatoes. We're using cauliflower and grain. So we're just bringing it to a boil, lowering it, covering it, simmering it, and then eventually we're going to mash it up in our food processor. Right. So, I'm gonna make, speaking of which, I'm going to make a little room on my countertop here for my food processor so that while that gets going, we're going to now move to yeah, that's going good. our sauce. And once you have the zucchini and the tomatoes, right? What are you doing? What are you doing with them? Just set them aside for now. Okay. We'll cook those not until the mash is ready because those will be really quick and only take okay. five minutes. So okay. I want them to be warm. And where did the garlic go? What's the that? Garlic? The garlic. We haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Yeah, we haven't gotten. Sorry, there. I came in late, so now I'm like. <laughs> no worries. No worries. <laughs> All right. So. Are we all together now, ready to move on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Move on to our sauce, our sorrel sauce, or for most of us tonight, an arugula sauce or an arugula-based sauce, because I couldn't find sorrel. I know a couple of you couldn't. Sorrel actually comes from the same family as spinach. It's like a cousin of spinach and looks very much like baby spinach, only it's a bit more pale in color. And it has the young baby leaves have a nice buttery taste, which make them wonderful for salads uh, mm. or to throw in soups or sauces. It has a like a almost lemony tangy taste to it, which is why I think they suggest arugula with some lemon rind and juice as a good substitute. So um, that being said, let's go to our sauce. Let me go ahead. Basically, I'm going to put everything into the food processor. So one and a half cups of your sorrel leaves or your alternative leaves. The arugula, right? Yeah, I, I'm using arugula tonight. I couldn't find uh, sorrel leaves. So you can also use any leafy green that is probably a little darker in color, like spinach or, or kale. So a cup and a half. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you also cut a wedge of lemon. I think it's a, just about a tablespoon of fresh lemon juice and lime to add if you're not using the sorrel. So make sure you've scrubbed your lemon and squeeze that in. And let's see, I think I have a microblade somewhere in here. This, by the way, is one of the best investments you can have in your kitchen, by the way. It's great for getting all kinds of wonderful salad dressings and zest and all that stuff. <laughs> awesome. 
<laughs> Sharon Sisa's daughter is just saying, oh, she knows a lot about cooking. Awesome. <laughs> Take my lemon wedge here. I'm just using microplaner to get a little bit of the rind in with the arugula leaves. Hopefully my back is not blocking it too much. I'm trying to explain what I'm doing as clearly as I can. So you can't see me, you can follow the sound of my voice. Then to this, we're going to add half a cup of our packed watercress leaves or whatever your substitute is. If you don't have watercress, use more arugula, spinach, what have you. I was fortunate enough to find some watercress. Oh, I think it's so pretty. How it comes to this nice little ball root, right? I really like watercress in the summer, especially. Now, I how much of the how much of the watercress? The watercress we want to use, what do I have here? Half a cup. Half a cup of packed watercress. And I, you know, I don't pluck the leaves off. I use the stems. I throw it all in there. It's going to go in the food processor. So I tend to do that anytime I'm cooking with herbs that have a lot of leaves on them, especially if I'm making a sauce or a soup. I don't bother doing a little pluck. I just throw it all in there. Just more fiber. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you're a working mom or business owner, you don't have a lot of time. And so when you're trying to make healthy, nutrient dense meals in a short amount of time, that's one of my favorite time cutting techniques is to just use the stems of lots of my herbs when I'm cooking. Not always, but especially if I'm gonna be blending it down or throwing it into a sauce and cooking it down. Now it says pat, so I'm gonna make sure I really get that in there. It's great, I'll just get through my whole bunch here. I'm gonna... Okay, so now we're going to go to a the... cup of extra virgin olive oil. Where the hell is your watercress? <laughs> I do pull it out. Oh, oh, Sorry, Chris, you said a half a cup? Yep, half a cup of olive oil. Half a cup of olive oil in there? Yeah, it's typically almost like making a pesto. Because to this, mm -hmm. we're going to add some walnut. Okay, this is a cup of this one. A quarter cup of walnuts. Cup of walnuts. walnuts are especially loaded with omega-3 fatty acids. That's really good for brain health and for draining a lot of lymph around the brain, around the lymphatic cells, which some of you know I dork out about my anatomy. And, uh, it's often that systemic chronic inflammation around those glial cells in the brain that are a contributing factor to degenerative, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia. That's more than a quarter cup. How big those are. Woo! Super dry and unroasted. I should have specified that in the list. But you know, use what you got. I don't worry too much about being exact with ingredients because again, once you start to learn the language of the tastes and what ingredients have what taste, 
you start to really be the master of your own medicine in the kitchen. And you can easily reach for substitute ingredients because you know, oh, that has the same taste. And I want to favor those pungent, bitter, astringent tastes. It's not that you don't have sweet, sour, salty. You just have less of those and more of the pungent, bitter, astringent taste during the spring. That's what's going to suck out all this excess mucus and heaviness out of the body. And then for those of you who have dryness and acute inflammation regionally or locally, that coolness and water content of our greens, zucchini and tomato are gonna to come in and be the nice fire extinguisher for that. So three garlic cloves are going into our sauce. I have to say, since moving to Colorado, doing these kinds of events is great with the time difference because those that are new to Ayurveda and yogic living are still traditionally eating their meal times pretty late. And as you start to get deeper into this lifestyle and practice, you'll learn that one of the habits is to have an early light dinner. And so you'll find that all of the oh recipes we're making this week are light in nature. That is the medicinal value that we're looking for right now, this time of year, where most of us live. I don't think I have any international viewers today. Are you noticing I'm pounding and crushing my garlic heads before I take the skin off? It makes it easier. Just lay them flat with my knife and do a big pound down. And then easily the skin comes right off. So once you've got three cloves there, I would chop them up roughly just so that these huge cloves don't just get launched and circle around the food processor with everything else. But again, just a rough chop or slice, nothing fancy. Go ahead and add that in. This is the pungent taste with the garlic here. Again, you can experiment with the ratios of the ingredients as you practice observing its post-digestive effect. Two tablespoons of soft goat cheese. Or the goat cheese. <laughs> you can also use uh, vegan cream cheese as an alternative, but personally, I don't do vegan cheeses. Um, I don't eat much dairy at all, but when I do, uh, soft cheeses like cheddar cheeses or uh, brie are certainly going to be a bit easier and diet more friendly to the gut um, during this time of year. So in the springtime, in general, Ayurveda recommends avoiding dairy, but when you do have it, this is the better kind of cheese to have. Take two teaspoons of this. This is what's going to make it a nice cream of the cream cheese. <laughs> what's that? Did someone have a question? The what of the cream cheese? I'm good. The what of the cream cheese? Tablespoon? It's just an alternative to the goat cheese. The recipe calls for goat cheese. I know, but I didn't get the goat cheese. <laughs> okay, so the, you whatever you got, it could be ricotta even. No, I got some vegan. The substitute you told me to get. Great. Take yeah. half a teaspoon of salt. Half a teaspoon of that. Of salt. Of the cream cheese, I'm saying. How much two, of the cream cheese? Two teaspoons of the cheese. That's it. little bit of salt, and then a quarter teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper. Mm -hmm. Again, adding to that pungency. Mm 
We're gonna take a tablespoon of balsamic vinegar. I'm going to do this without cutting my fill. Uh, some salt. Okay. All right. Cover and blend away. Go ahead. I'm going to mute myself so I don't blast you guys with the sound of this. Uh, blender and you can mute your cells as well. You have to stop intermittently, scrape it down with the spatula and we're just gonna blend it until it's nice and smooth. Hope I got everything in there. <laughs> I mean, you myself too, right? I'm just myself. lifting this cover off. I got this waft of bouquet. Oh, it smells so good. Chris? Yeah. Okay. With uh, the balsamic vinegar, not yet, right? Just put a tablespoon in with the greens. With the with which ones? In the blender with the. Sauce. In the blender, I suppose. I thought so. How yep. much? Just a tablespoon. How much? Tablespoon. Super easy. And I'm a big fan of tasting things along the way. See if you need to maybe adjust any of the seasons. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, that's nice. Woo! Peppery. Peppery with the arugula. And even the fresh cracked pepper. Uh -huh. Freshly squeezed lemon. It's a nice zang. Woo! Hello. Put that aside. And see, we're like 90% of the way there already, right? So about now we've got maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes left of our millet. Okay, let's taste it. See. So we'll use that. Time to cook zucchini. It so tastes good. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. 
my large roasting pan. Go ahead and heat it up. I'd say medium heat. For what? We're going to get ready to saute the zucchini and tomatoes next. Okay. And you want me to saute with um with a little bit of olive oil. You can also use organic sunflower oil, which is okay. a little bit lighter and a little less warming than sesame seed oil. Typically in the spring season, it mm -hmm. has cooler temperatures. So we want foods that are going to be heating as our body digests them. And those pungent flavors and those, the millet grain does a great job bringing a heating element after it's been digested. Okay, now how much oil? For that one, so, teaspoon at the bottom of the pan, maybe two tablespoons. Two Your tablespoons. zucchini's already been tossed in oil, so kind of just right. so it's not going to stick a little bit. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I also have some ghee too, Chris. Are we going to be using that later? You can. That is a great substitute to saute the zucchini in. So okay. you're welcome to do that instead. Ghee is clarified butter for those of you who don't know. It's a wonderful high quality fat that you can use to stimulate digestion in the gut without overheating it. So if you're someone that does have acute inflammation and pain in a joint, then know that ghee might be even a better oil. It's less heating to the gut than any of the others like the olive oil, for example. So I'm gonna let that warm up a bit. Does anyone have any questions about these ingredients or in general? I mentioned earlier how a yogic Ayurvedic practice has early light dinners. Generally, we want to have finished eating no later than six, 6.30 is I think more realistic in the modern world, especially now that a lot of us are telecommuting and working at least part of the time at home. So cooking earlier is a little bit more accessible to us than it was a year plus ago. And working it into your lifestyle as you can will be of great benefit to your physiology and to your immune strength. Because what often happens, particularly here in our Western culture is we're just eating too much, we're eating too late, and we're eating too heavy, meaning the types of foods we're eating are actually dense in nature, often including a lot of meat or heavy carbs. So those in an Ayurvedic perspective, we would say if you're going to eat those kinds of foods, you want to eat them midday when the sun is high and the digestive strength is the best. But in the evening, when we're winding down the day, so is our physiology. So we want to be eating lighter portions with lighter ingredients a lot earlier in the evening. And that gives the gut time to actually process the food. So when we go to bed, we're going to bed with an empty stomach. Why is that important? Because we need to allocate our body's bandwidth when we're sleeping to do the deeper detoxifying of the body that happens in organs like the liver and the gallbladder. And if we're not sleeping well at night because our gut is still digesting food, the body can't allocate the resources it needs to actually do that deep liver and blood cleaning in the evening as our bodies are designed to do. So eating too late, no bueno. And it takes practice, especially when culturally so much of our social scene centers around meeting for dinner or having a drink at happy hour, but happy hours like when we get out of work, when we get home from work, which is usually what, maybe 6.30, the best for most of us. So. Anyway, that's my soap opera there. Let me get back to cooking. Let's get some oil in this warm pan. We'll start sauteing our zucchini. I like to do this over medium heat, medium high heat. I'm 
I'm always okay. curious what kinds of cookware people use in their kitchens. I'm a big fan of spending your money. I should say investing, not spending, investing your money in good cookware. Cookware that's going to last a while and not be toxic to you and your family. So I like to use, this is it's kind of funny because most of my pans are stainless steel from, I think Emerald. Yeah, it's from Emerald's cookware line, which oh, these pots are fantastic. I love the handles and the ergonomics of them when you're lifting heavy pans and the heat distribution is nice and even and it's easy to clean and you're not leaching any chemicals like I don't know what's in that Teflon or Ceflon, uh, Keflon, whatever. That non-stick treatment that's in so many pans is pretty toxic. You don't want to be cooking in that stuff. You want stainless steel, copper bottom, or uh, even cast iron if, if you're up to it. I'm not quite there yet. I, I do have a small cast iron skillet that is my baby step into cooking, but I just don't have the discipline for, or the bandwidth to maintain and keep seasoning it and, and the like. So I haven't quite used it that much, but this pan I'm actually using right now is a Calphalon, C-A-L-P-H-A-L-O-N mm -hmm. uh, from Kitchen Essentials. And all of my cookware I like because it goes from stove to oven, to stove. So whatever you invest in, make sure you can do that, especially if you live in a part of the world where you have multiple seasons and different cooking methods. You know, Ayurveda generally is going to recommend during the spring that you steam or you grill your food, not necessarily put a heavy substance like oil onto it during a typically heavy season. But we're modifying here. I wasn't quite ready to take my laptop out to the grills just yet. And not everyone has a grill. So I wanted to keep it simple and not turn on the oven. So we're pan roasting today, but depending on what kind of cookware you have, you can impact the quality of your food as well. Am I making sense what I'm saying? I feel like I'm. Yeah, yeah, happy. yeah. Okay, cool. I'm gonna move that around a little bit. Yeah. I'm gonna turn that up just a little bit and I'm gonna add a cover to my zucchini just to help sweat it out a little bit, cook a little more quickly. I have a bit so they're not quite in a single layer in the bottom of the pan. So some of them aren't cooking as fast. Mm -hmm. Cover it, I know they'll cook a little more uniformly there. So I'm gonna do that for about a minute or two. We just want to cook them enough so that they're tender but still have a little bit of a crisp or crunch to them. That's another wonderful quality that balances the heavy, damp, cool nature this time of year. That slow digestion that brings us ama, sluggishness, and allergies. Really, allergies are. I know that this is a pretty strong statement to make, but allergies are optional. You know, it really is about the strength of your gut. And if your gut can process and eliminate what it doesn't need to build strong, healthy tissue. And that's where we get into trouble. We build up this AMA by not having a strong digestive capacity. We <laughs> suffocate it with a lot of heavy food too late at night and eat it in a poor state of mind or right? <laughs> it's a practice and the how you eat is as important as the what you eat in Ayurveda which is why I wanted to do this series and just get people back in the kitchen get you inspired to commune with your food which really is medicine we feed our sense organs every day with information. It's how we interact and with the world around us, how we move through life. So what we feed the sense organs is just as important as what we feed our bellies, what's on the plate. So 
take the time to actually appreciate handling your ingredients. That's where half of the medicine comes from is in the prep work. The texture, the colors, the fragrances, all of these things are nourishment to the nervous system and help strengthen the power of your digestive capacity. It really is something to reconnect with if you want to harness power back into mm -hmm. your health. All right, I'm gonna start to make better. I'm just gonna mix them up a little bit more. Get some of the bottom ones up on top. Salute, guys, from <laughs> my water. I love zucchini. <laughs> now, the recipe doesn't call for the tomatoes to be cooked with the zucchini. It actually recommends that you toss them in at the end when you dress it with the sauce. But I personally like to not have too much of a temperature contrast in my meals. And my cherry tomatoes have been sitting in the fridge, so they're still a little cool. So when we get to the last minute or so of the zucchini, I'm going to throw my sliced tomatoes in with them just to warm them up a little bit and have more of a consistent temperature in my dish. But you do you and decide what you want to do if you're feeling a little excess heat in your body. Hey, where do I put my walnuts? Where do my walnuts go? The your walnuts, walnuts went are part of the green sauce. So I should add it, right? How much? Uh, walnuts were a quarter cup, I believe. Sorry that I'm so behind. one off with millet. Had to stop by my grandchildren today, you know? <laughs> So it got no out worries. of my schedule. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. A quarter cup, right? Yeah. Now, at the 30 minute mark, go ahead and start mixing your millet and cauliflower. The millet should start to be breaking up. And as you stir it, it'll start to thicken the liquid. And mine probably is a little bit more. So I'm going to continue simmering mine for another five minutes. But if yours is breaking up nicely, then go ahead and just turn off the heat, take it off, and let it stand for the last five minutes. Because you're going to want to cool that a little bit before we make it mash. That way we don't blow up our blenders. Starting to take on a more of that translucent mist. <laughs> I'm going to throw in my tomatoes now because I know they'll be ready in a few minutes.
How's everybody doing? Okay, so now, uh, good, good. Okay. All right, so basically, put the stuff in the blender, right? Because you're gonna blend, put something in it. Yeah, the food the processor green. is for the puree. So that's where you put your arugula, your walnuts, your balsamic vinegar, your mm -hmm. um, half a cup of oil, kind of like a pesto. Mm -hmm. And then that's finished? Yep. And then you're going to put it aside. And then what about the cauliflower? The cauliflower is cooking with your millet. Right, but how much? One and a half cups of cauliflower. No, I know all of that. Um, it's cooking. What I'm, are you going to also put it in the blender? Um, later, I, well, separate, not with the sauce. I That's have an immersion blender. Yeah, you can, if you only have one blender exactly. to use, then put that sauce in a container, maybe rinse it out so that you can whip up the mash once it cools down a little bit. Yeah. That's what I will do. Yeah, I, I, need, I, I need my blender. Now I mentioned how millet has much more protein in it than other grains. So that means that it takes a little longer to digest. So to help that along, we're going to add about maybe half a teaspoon of cumin. These can be ground or whole seeds. Doesn't really matter. So we're going to blend it up anyway. Have a teaspoon. As much as you want. Yeah, half a teaspoon is a good start. In, in the cauliflower? Yep. In the cauliflower and millet. It's basically to help you digest the millet. Yeah, a little bit for me. Yeah. Two minutes good, yeah. You, if you were to make the millet as like a porridge, what would you add for a spice to it? To uh, if I were going to make it like a savory kind of uh -huh. cream grain, you mean? Yeah, I'm thinking like breakfast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say go, go with the sweeter uh, spices, your cinnamon, mm -hmm. your no cardamom, your ginger. Okay. And okay. I make a blend of those three ingredients in equal proportions as a sweet okay. spice mix. I make okay. it in bulk. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. any time I cook a grain for breakfast, I hit it with that. Mm -hmm. That's and it's fantastic. You so also, cinnamon, ginger, and what else? Cinnamon, mm -hmm. ginger, uh, ginger, and cardamom, ground cardamom. cardamom. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So equal portions. Okay. Yep. Super, super awesome. And then if you wanted to add or have it add a little bit more bulk, like say you were going to go do one of your F94, <laughs> whatever it is, workouts that you do, you know, that might not be enough. So you could add some soaked um, dates. Okay. Would be to that as a All nice right, breakfast porridge. Yep. Oh. I'm going to take my cauliflower and millet off of the burner so it can continue cooling a little bit before I whip it up. I'll turn off the heat to my zucchini and tomatoes because those sound like they are rocking. This is another one of my best inventions or investments for the kitchen is these immersion blenders. If you don't have one of these, y'all, I'm telling you, it makes for cleanup to be a lot easier <laughs> since you can just go ahead and process what you're making in the pan you're cooking it in. Oh, yeah. Oh, you mean that kind? Yeah. These you want oh, buy. Generally, like even Target, Walmart, 
I may have one of those somewhere. Yep. Yeah. Where's my cumin? You didn't tell us about cumin. I know, I'm sorry. That was an ad lib, my cumin. It's not officially in the recipe. It's just my little flexing knowledge. Add the cumin for the millet. Yeah, the cumin, like the high. When I'm looking at it, ahead and there you go. Right in going to go ahead and mute myself and then blend. So how, how is everyone's millet mash? Mine is super soupy and I realized I accidentally put too much water in it. No, ours, mine looks like mashed potatoes. Nice, nice. Yeah, it tastes really good. I don't think I've ever had millet. Yeah, millet has a really uh, nutty taste to it. Oftentimes, because we used it in a mash today, we rinsed it and used it damp. But traditionally, when you cook millet, you would toast it dry before you cook it. And it helps bring out some of the more nuttiness of it. And, uh, but you know, I'm a foodie. Might be a detail not worth. Well, we used to do that with quinoa too. Yeah, you, with any grain, really. Yeah. Um, all right. So now. We are hopefully ready to plate. I'm going to want people to come off camera when you plate so we can get a screenshot of all of our dishes. So you can put your bed of millet down first, your mash. In my case, it's like a porridge. That's okay. I think I might later add some cauliflower, maybe add some more millet and continue cooking it a little bit more to get to the thickness I want. We'll see how that works. But you go ahead and plate yours and then on top put your zucchini and tomato mixture. And then we'll have the sauce or puree on top of that. green sauce here. Drizzle that on top. That's going to add a nice like peppery lemony kick to it. This also I imagine would be fantastic as a spread on wraps or sandwiches. This would be awesome. Or like a dip at a party even. Right? Thinking outside the box in terms of how we can nourish ourselves in a way that's not harmful. And voila. Our roasted zucchini and tomato with sorrel or arugula sauce on top of 
your millet mash. Let's let's see it, everybody. Those of you that are able. I don't have a, uh, a screen a video screen. button. Oh. Next time. It may be a setting, Chris, because it I don't show camera being an option for my level. Is that right? Let me do this. Let me try. It's really good though. Good. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm ready to taste this now. I'm just gonna have to figure that out later. Next week recipe also uses millet and uh, you'll get that recipe sent out as well with ample time to get your ingredients. Mm. Oh yeah. I'm liking that sauce. Thumbs up. Portions. We say in Ayurveda, two hands put together is roughly the size of your stomach. You wanna fill a third of that space with your food, a third of the space to allow for any liquids that you're drinking or sipping with your meal or liquids from the zucchini and tomatoes. And the third space is left empty. That's so that the stomach actually has space to churn and process and digest. So going along with those, early light dinners, that can be a nice guide for uh, portions if you're ever looking for one. So that's what I have planned for you today. I hope that was fun. I definitely know it's tasty. And hopefully I've inspired you a little bit to think about qualities of your food. What ingredients are naturally growing where you live? When in doubt, talk to your farmers at the far, far, farmer's market and ask them what's coming up now or in the next few weeks. What are the young buds or leaves of these lettuces that are first coming out early in the summer? And favor what is peak because nature knows and the biome and the soil and the organisms that make up that world change every season and with it it impacts the roots and shoots of the plants we're eating and if you eat animal protein of the animals that we're eating, who are eating the plants. So eating seasonally and just knowing what is naturally growing in your region is 80% of the battle, in my opinion. You don't need to worry yourself with memorizing lists of nutrient values and calories and mineral content. It's interesting to know but I think it does more harm personally than help. I think particularly women tend to get a little too conditioned to micro focus on these things. And it only adds in what I've seen a lot more anxiety, a lot more stress and a lot more challenge that doesn't need to be there when we're trying to develop a healthy relationship to our food and not be fearful of it, but celebrate it, which is really how it should be. It, it does sustain us. So any questions before we wrap up? All right. No, thank you very much, Chris. You're welcome. Enjoy. And next week we'll have a new recipe out and same link to join. You don't need to sign up every week. Just know this is where we'll be on Wednesday nights at five and you can join or catch the replay as you're able. Namaste. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome.